Yes, I know he holds the future And life is worth the living just because he lives Because he lives I can face tomorrow Because he lives All fear is gone Because I know Yes, I know He holds the future And life is worth the living just because he lives. Good evening and welcome, uh, brethren. I'd like to uh, ask Dan if you'll come forward and come and say a prayer for us. Uh, just like to inform you that Tom and Linda and Ledge and others have got this dreadful flu. Uh, also, um, uh, Brother Bester, Johann Bester is back from, I've got the names here, Daniel. Uh, Johann Bester is back from, uh, uh, from Botswana, but he's been bedridden. Uh, he came to my house yesterday. He looked like a ghost. He was so pale and full of flu. He was looking for some medication. So I looked into my mini disc game at home and, and gave, <laughs> gave him some medication. Uh, please, uh, would you pray for Johann Bester as well? Uh, also, um, I was just told this evening uh, by, uh, let me just have a look here, sorry, um, by Tracy Harris that her mother-in-law, Rhea, uh, has been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. So please pray for Rhea Harris, I've got her name here as well, uh, Daniel. And then Kareen Davis, Kareen is a cousin of uh, Jessica. Uh, Stradom, who's one of our students. Uh, Karine is the daughter of Judy uh, Davis, and, uh, and of course Judy and Shireen are sisters. And as you know, they lost their mom a few months ago, and now uh, Judy's daughter Karine is in hospital, also with stage four uh, cervical cancer. So she's only, I think, about 38 or 39. She's got two young children in their early teens. So. Uh, She's devastated at this news as well. Also, the Bible College students are writing exams. That's why you don't see them here. Uh, they are writing exams at this time, so they're having chapel uh, at the Bible College for the next two weeks. So uh, also continue to keep the hunts in prayer on the passing of uh, Uncle Arthur's brother, Raymond, uh, that uh, died recently. So if there's, is there any other news that we need to share that we know of, anything recent? It's good to uh, see Sister Yvonne with us. As you know, she had successful rotator cuff surgery, and uh, she's going to take it easy. She can't throw um Chris around anymore like she used to. So, uh, Daniel, please come. Say a prayer. Oh, yeah, sorry. Solly, thank you for that. I knew there was something. Solly, and I, I don't know how to pronounce the surname, Como, passed away recently. Uh, uh, he was a, a leading member at the Davidson Congregation. And I think he was a relative of the late Simon Magagula. He used to work in the prisons, and Brother Louis knew him very well. So the Soli and Como family uh, of Davidton. Brother Daniel, please come. Good evening. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we are so thankful tonight that... Uh, we can come and, and learn about you, Lord, that we can come and study. And I just pray that the lessons that we'll hear tonight will encourage us uh, and help us to be uh, better servants for you, Father. We come before you tonight um, and we thank you that we can uh, petition you and we can, we can come to you in prayer, Lord, and uh, that you hear our prayers. Uh, we think of the many tonight uh, that, that are sick at this time, Father, that, are, that have flu and, and other illnesses, Lord. Um, we know it's a difficult time of the year for that, Father, and we just pray that you'll help, uh, you'll help them. We think especially of um, Uncle Tom and Auntie Linda. Uh, we think of Johan Bester um, and many others that, that are sick at, at this stage. Uh, we think of Le uh, Ledge. And, Lord, we just pray that you'll help them to get better so that uh, they can join us again, Father. Um, we think for, Lord, we think of uh, 
Rhea Harris's family, Lord, uh, we also pray for um, Kareen Davis, that you'll help them, Father, with their illnesses, that, uh, that you'll help them through, through the tough times that, that they're going through, Father. We think of the students, we think uh, of them as they write exams, that, Lord, that they'll study not just uh, to pass the exam, but to be able to one day go out and, and share, your, share your word, Father. And to be to be pre preachers in your kingdom, Lord. We think of the Hunt family as well, with the with the passing of Raymond, and we just pray that you'll you'll comfort them, Lord. That uh, that you'll you'll watch over them through through this tough time. Uh, we think of um, Solly's family, Lord, and, and we're so thankful for the life he lived and and for the impact that he had on your church, Lord. And, and we're so thankful for that uh, that he's gone to his reward in heaven. We uh, thankful that we can all be here, Father. We thankful that uh, Auntie Yvonne's surgery went well, and just pray that uh, you'll help her uh, recover uh, fully, Lord. We want to thank you for this and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing two songs. The first hymn is a precious Lord take my hand, which is a 59, 59. Precious Lord, take my hand. <clears throat> When my way groweth drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life fears almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, Lead me home when the shadows appear and the night draweth near and the day is o'er <coughs> as the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. The next one is 93. 93, which is, um, I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus. 93. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than every chest untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread swing. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this word affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather 
the hath Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread swing. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. He is fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He is sweeter than honey from out of the comb. He is all that my hunger rings spirits need. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread swing. i rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Thank you, Brother Clive. Tonight we're going to be talking about responding to evil. And uh, our text is taken from Matthew's Gospel... Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at those, lo uh, those last few verses there, verses 38 through 42. Matthew 5, 38 through 42. So I don't know if I'm the only one that struggles with this kind of thing. <laughs> okay. But I think that at some point in our lives, all of us come face to face with being done in, with something maybe said against us that's untrue, or something done toward us that we didn't deserve or felt was unmerited. And so basically we're going to be looking at that tonight in terms of how we respond uh, to it. The Stoics, one of the tenets of Stoicism, and by the way, Stoicism is mentioned by Paul in the Bible, so, so I'm not talking about something that's foreign to the Scriptures, uh, and very often Stoicism agrees with what the Scriptures teach, and one of the tenets of Stoicism says that it's not so much what happens to you as how you respond to it. It's more important when it comes to how you respond uh, rather than what happens to you. So in his Sermon on the Mount, this is just to recap, Jesus taught concerning the righteousness of the kingdom. And remember what Jesus said, he set the benchmark very, very high. Just in case people of that day thought that the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of the day, that they were the standard of righteousness, Jesus says, no, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so it's a tall order, isn't it, that Jesus presents. But he doesn't just leave the people hanging. He goes on to explain why he said so. And Jesus then uh, recalibrates the law, if you will. He resets the standard, and he makes it a matter of the heart and not outward observance, which is what the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day did. And, of course, this was based on how they interpreted the law. Uh, we have looked at uh, contrasts that Jesus presented, like murder and anger. Remember, we looked at that last week. 
Um, I didn't want to go and deal with this aspect of adultery and remarriage all over again because we've dealt with that already. Uh, and uh, adultery and divorce and that kind of thing. We also at some time in the past dealt with the swearing of oaths. And uh, Jesus simply said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond that is of the evil one. In other words, your character should be of such a standard that when you say yes or you say no, the person who is receiving that information will believe it and will not need extra proof. Uh, or, or, or need you to swear. Uh, you know, I don't know if it still is common, but there was a time when people would say, I swear, you know, um, and, and they, they would swear by all that's holy. And, and if someone has to do that, it tells you that something is wrong. I mean, I've heard people, and I shudder when I think of this, I've heard people say, I swear on my mother's grave, you know. Or, uh, or on, my, on the life of my child. I mean, whew, you know, and, and you, we shudder because Jesus uh, prohibits the taking of oaths. Now there is a time to take oaths. Like, for example, when you are standing in a court of law, you have to take an oath. I, uh, Petrus, Johannes, Cornelius van Staden, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help me. God is an oath you are to take in the court of law, yes, sir. Put your one end on the Bible. By the way, talking about that, Brother Louis just reminded me that decades ago in the United States, uh, members of the Church of Christ were known as walking Bibles. Remember that? They were known as walking Bibles, and if there wasn't a Bible in the courtroom, they would ask if there was a member of the Church of Christ present. I'm serious. And then <laughs> you could put, put your hand on that person's head. Anyway, that was just uh, on the by and by. So in this lesson, we will look at what Jesus taught concerning vengeance, Matthew 5, 38 to 42. Uh, and as we discuss responding to evil, we need to compare firstly the law of Moses and the traditional interpretation. Remember, Jesus refers to that traditional interpretation, the oral rendering of the law by saying, you have heard it said, or you have heard it said uh, by those of old. So uh, let's take a look at Matthew 5, 38 through 42. All right, so he's dealing with, just dealt with swearing. Now verse 38, you have heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, there comes the, the recalibration. I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Whew, that's serious heartburn there. Eh? Verse 43, for you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Okay. Uh, verse 43, but I say again, Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Another tall order. Verse 45, Jesus says, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect." Again, when you look at the standard that Jesus presents, here he brings in his Father as the standard of righteousness and the standard of grace, showing grace even to those who don't deserve it. That is a very, very big standard. Now, this eye for eye and tooth for tooth interpretation, interpretation is found in Exodus chapter 21, 24 through 25. And here... I believe God, through Moses, was regulating uh, the, it's called the law of retaliation. How far you can go in exacting vengeance or retribution. Exodus 21, 24, and 25. But if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. 
burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Um, there's another uh, parallel passage found in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 19, uh, verse 21. And it says, Your eye shall not pity. Life shall be for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. So these laws were for the courts to apply, for the civil courts. These were not laws for individuals uh, to apply. And if you look at, we are, we are in Deuteronomy 19, just have a look at uh, the following verses. Um, where are we? Uh, 15 through 21. One witness shall not rise against the man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. There's another place where it says credible or reliable witnesses. The truth shall be established. If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days. You see, there's the, the civil the civil authorities, and the judges shall make careful inquiry, and indeed, if the witness is a false witness, who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother, so you shall put away the evil from among you. In other words, this was to set a precedent and set a standard, so that if any other false witnesses thinks he can do the same, by the judgment meted out to that false witness in the court, the others will fear. Look at what he says. Verse 20, and those who remain shall hear and fear, and hereafter they shall not again commit such evil among you. So this was a precedent, and uh, God wanted the people to, 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 to fear his commandments, and so to drive out the evil from among them. Um, also Exodus 21, 22, and 23 basically says the same thing, so we're not going to go there. So... These laws were given to guide the priests and the judges in meeting out proper punishment. They had to investigate it properly. And I don't know if you had the same thought as I had while reading this. Think about how they judged our Lord Jesus. What did the, the, the religious leaders of the day do when it came to Jesus' case? Remember the two things that they, they held against him? One was making himself equal with God, blasphemy, and the other one? was healing on the Sabbath. They, 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 they hated him for healing on the Sabbath. And uh, one of the reasons why they, they sought to, to put him to, to death. But the main charge, obviously, was the charge of blasphemy. And so they had to uh, stir up the mob. They had to get false witnesses to say that he said this and he said that. And, of course, Jesus did not have the, uh, the, the right or the don't want to use the word privilege. He didn't have the, um, yeah, maybe right is the right word, you know, of having his case investigated properly. And as you know, because of the closeness to the Passover, the religious leaders wanted to railroad this case through the courts. They met at night, which they were not supposed to do, because judges had to have a good night's rest, uh, so they had to rest that night and judge with a clear mind during the day. And uh, we know that Jesus' Jesus's case was actually a travesty of justice. So, what did the scribes and the Pharisees do? They had interpreted these statements so as to justify personal retribution. And they applied them frequently, taking matters of revenge into their own hands. And I think case in point, like they did with Jesus. You know, they gave Jesus a mockery of a, of a trial. And of course, as people do today as well. The law repeatedly forbade personal vengeance. If you look at Leviticus 19 and verse 18. Leviticus 19, 18. Sounds almost like the year that that, the law, that, that law was passed. 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Could this maybe be what Jesus had in mind? Because in the passage we just read in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, this is what Jesus actually talks about. You know, loving one's neighbor. And we know he, 
Uh, he repeated that as well in Matthew 12, 29 to 31. Remember that quintessential question, what is the greatest of the commandments? Also, it's found in Matthew 22, 37 through 39. The same question is, is, is found there as well. And, uh, of course, remember the first one was to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second one was like it or similar to it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And these were things that God always had in mind for the nation. You know, but over time, when uh, something is taken out of context, misinterpreted, or deliberately twisted, and if it's repeated often enough, eventually people believe the, the untruth. I know we've said this before ad nauseum, but I remember Brother Fred, the first time when, we, when he spoke about communism in class, when I was in his class uh, many years ago for public speaking, uh, and homiletics, Brother Fred said, they asked the question after the Iron Curtain had fallen, uh, and a, a delegation, of course, delegations from all over the world went to the USSR to go and find out, well, the former USSR, what had happened, you know, what dismantled the Iron Curtain, but also, why did communism last for 50 years in that part of the world? And this is what they said. They said, firstly, when you lie, tell a big lie. And secondly, you have to tell it often. So when you lie, you tell a big lie and you tell it often. And that's when people believe the lie. I'm going to illustrate. And maybe this is not something that's bad, but it's just by way of illustration. Some will say, the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. Right? It's not in the Bible. The idea is there. But the Bible doesn't state that God helps those who, helps themse who help themselves, right? And you, we've heard it so often that sometimes people believe that it actually comes from the Bible. Another one is cleanliness is next to godliness, right? We know it's good to, you know, especially times like these, sanitize, wash your hands regularly. Cleanliness, personal hygiene is good. But uh, we don't have a verse in the Bible that says that. But the more something is repeated, the more it is reinforced. Okay, so uh, Leviticus 19, 18, we read that. Proverbs, let's, let's go to Proverbs chapter 20, uh, verse 22. We're jumping around a lot tonight, but it's good because then we consult various books of the Bible. Proverbs 20 and verse 22. Do not say, I will recompense evil. Wait for the Lord, and he will save you. So here's the idea of not repaying. The original language means uh, to repay, you know, for an evil that's done against you. And that is so, uh, it, is, it is such a, a pervasive thing in the heart of man. Remember that we, we have the fallen nature within us. We have this flesh, we are living in a fleshly body, and I think one of the easiest things to actually draw a parallel here, or to use this example, and I struggle with this every day, maybe not as much as I used to, but someone cuts you off in traffic. This, this afternoon I was on my way to home affairs again, <laughs> and uh, uh, a car that was behind me uh, came around me and without indicating cut in front of me. Now, you know how you feel when someone does that, right? And especially when you're in a hurry and you also want to get through the traffic light, which is a couple of hundred meters ahead. He made it through the traffic light. I didn't. So you're sitting there and you're kind of seething, you know, but every time you have to just resist that urge and just let it go. And over time, obviously, it becomes easier. And I think also there's this idea that we... Uh, you know, there's the sense of, 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 uh, of when an injustice is done toward you. Someone cuts in front of you in the line, you know, maybe at the bank or at uh, the supermarket. You know, you, you have that, you want to go to the person and say, excuse me, but I was here first. You know, there is that. But over time, you know, as we let things like that go, because how important is it? So maybe I'm going to get through the checkout two minutes or three minutes or five minutes later. You know, maybe that's going to prevent me from something else later on. You know, uh, some, some other 
thing worse, maybe an accident later on by being five minutes late. Let's continue. Proverbs 24, 29 says, Do not say, I will do to him just as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to, uh, to his work. And again, maybe Solomon here, the proverb writer, had in his mind what the law had said. You know, the law that was given through Moses, the law of retribution. Maybe this is what he, uh, what he had in mind. I don't know. But in both the Old and the New Testaments, the matter of vengeance was to be left up to God and his duly appointed agent, meaning the civil government. Okay? Uh, if you go to Romans chapter 12, we will find a reference to exactly that. Romans 12, 19. I think from verse 17. And again, you know, brethren, this is, a, this is not an easy thing to do. It's, it's really not an easy thing because we live in a, uh, in a world that is highly stressed. South Africa is one of the most stressed countries in the world. And so we have this agitation uh, and this angst, you know, very, very low beneath the surface. We might be smiling as we go around our business in the world, but you know, underneath there's a very, very short fuse, and, and, and I'm aware of it in myself so, so often. Verse 17 of, of uh, Romans 12, uh, repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And he's quoting from Leviticus 19.18, uh, and the second part that I will repay comes from Deuteronomy 32.35. In other words, if we leave room for God to act, God the righteous judge knows exactly how to repay the other person for what they've done to you and me. Here's maybe another sidebar. And again, Brother Louis, who's worked in prisons for many, many years, would probably have met up with people that took revenge on someone for what he had done uh, to either directly himself or to a family member. And by the way, I, I, I know I've mentioned this before, uh, I eventually I plucked up the courage a few months ago to watch the mafia, uh, these mafia movies, um, the Godfather, remember the Godfather trilogy? Yeah, and I don't like the parts two and three because of the swearing, and, uh, but the first one was actually really, really good. And, you know, one of the things with the mafia, it was all about respect, you know, and especially the Godfather. <laughs> I just like the way Marlon Brando plays that role of the Godfather, you know, and he, he says, uh, you come into my house and you disrespect me. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, and the guy that's visiting, the guy that is coming there for a favor from the Godfather, he now has to change his tactics. And he has to make the Godfather feel respected because if he gets on the wrong side of the Godfather, something could happen to his business tomorrow or one of his family members, you know, or... A shop could burn down accidentally. You know, that's how they took revenge, the mafia. And so you had these, these gang battles, you know, between one mafia family and another and another until they made peace. They would have these big family meetings and make peace and bury the hatchet. And so uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of heartache and personal pain can be prevented by not taking vengeance by leaving room for the wrath of God and I know and I'm not even going to go there tonight for the sake of time but there are what they call is a category of psalms call, called the imprecatory psalms where David especially prays and asks God to take vengeance on his enemies I was, I was reading a few of them uh, today uh, somewhere in the 50s, Psalm 54, 55, round about there, where David prays and asks God to take vengeance on his foes. Maybe we could go there, just look at one particular psalm very quickly. 
to illustrate what I'm talking about. I think it's Psalm 54. If you have any comments or any stories to tell, please shout it out. Uh, yes, uh, Psalm 50. Uh, yeah, Psalm 55. It's, he starts in Psalm 54 already, but 55 I think is clearer. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint and moan noisily because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they bring down trouble upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is severely pained within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape. Verse 9, destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. For I've seen violence and strife in the city. And uh, so he asks God to, to, to destroy, you know, the uh, verse 15. Look at verse 15 of, of Psalm 55. Let death seize them. <laughs> David is praying for God to kill them. Let them go down alive into shell, into the grave. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. And David says he's going to call upon God. And then verse 19, he says, God will hear and afflict them, even he who abides from of old, because they do not change, therefore they do not fear God. And then he talks about those who, uh, whose tongues are smoother than oil and butter, but there's war in their hearts. So there are several psalms like that where David appeals to God to, uh, to exact vengeance on his behalf. Uh, we were in Romans. If you're still in Romans, we can take a look at 13 as well. Romans 13, uh, 1 through 4. I think from verse 21 of Romans 12. Hold on, yes, this whole section here. Uh, Romans 12, 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Have, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Yes, we read that. From verse 20. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And I thought, where did this come from? There's actually an example of that in the Old Testament. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not, become, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. This is chapter 13. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment or receive judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror for, to good works, but to, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to do you, to do you good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's servant and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. One day I was stopped. I was still on a motorbike years ago. I was in Goodwood. And you know, generally, motor motorcyclists don't have a good reputation, generally, <laughs> by motorists and even the police. So when I came along with my little motorbike on my way somewhere, I think it was on Franz Conradi Drive, uh, just uh, adjacent to uh, N1 City, that uh, shopping mall, and this lady police woman jumps out and holds up her hand and waves me down. And she had a look on her face uh, that, uh, you know, was, I don't know if it was a look of glee, but she had that look like, yes, got one of these bikers. And she pulls me off, and I pulled off, switched the bike off, took my helmet off. I knew what she was going to ask me for, took out my wallet. When she came, I handed her my license. She looked at the bike, checked the bike's license, and I said to her, thank you for, for doing this, for, for uh, having a roadblock to stop vehicles. She looked at me, and she said, aren't you irritated? I said, no. I said, I've got nothing to hide. This is for people that do wrong, for people that don't have a license or a license on their vehicle. And she was blown away at my attitude for her pulling me off. But I genuinely felt that way, and I feel that there should be more roadblocks. And this is what the scripture is saying here. The people who need to be afraid are the wrongdoers, not so. Those who are driving without a license or with unroadworthy vehicles or those who are on their way to do evil, maybe transporting drugs or uh, illegal weapons or whatever the case might be, 
those are the ones that should be afraid, not those that are, 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 are doing what the, law, uh, what the law says. So there's no difference really between the law and what we find in the New Testament in this regard. Personal vengeance has no place in the lives of those who are the children of God. So let's just look more closely. Jesus proclaimed two principles here in Matthew 5.39a, to not resist an evil person. And not only should you not take vengeance into your own hands, but don't even oppose or resist the evil person when evil is being done. Of course, this is to yourself. Uh, we need to respond to evil by doing good. Uh, the passage we just read here uh, as well in Romans uh, chapter 12 uh, also illustrates this idea of rather doing good to the person. And as far as it depends on you to live peaceably with all persons. Now I know sometimes there are certain individuals that it is just so difficult. You know, because the person is maybe always angry or always, um, you know, maybe this person is just unkind to you or just does not like you. And despite your best efforts, there's nothing that you can do to change that person's mind. What do you do? All you have to do is let it go. You know, just let it go. And as far as it depends on you, live peaceably. If you've tried your level best to speak to that person, find out what you've done wrong or, or, or what their misperception is or, uh, about you, if you've done all of that, uh, then um, what else can you do? Um, Jesus also talks about turning the other cheek. Now, years ago, there was a guy called Ravi uh, Zacharias. Ravi, remember the Ravi Zacharias? He was uh, known to be an apologist uh, for Christendom. And he would travel around the world and go to various universities, and the students would come with their questions regarding uh, you know, the authenticity of the Bible, also uh, evolution versus creation, questions like that. Uh, and whether or not Christianity is the true faith. And he did quite a good job of refuting things like, uh, uh, you know, claims, you know, of, of evolution being, uh, you know, how the world came into being, etc. And also uh, he would make a defense for the Bible and, and also for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says he went to a um, university in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and there was a guy called Ahmad Didat. Some of us will remember Ahmad Didat. He was a guy that was born in India. He was a scholar and he specialized in comparative religions. And he had a photographic memory. And he could, he could remember and quote large portions of the Bible. And he would take on the denominations and he would take them apart. For a time he lived in Durban. This guy was at this conference in Kuala Lumpur at the University of uh, Malaysia. And uh, at this conference, uh, a professor who worked in this university who was, quote unquote, a Christian or a follower of Jesus, this man went to the podium and began to speak. And Ahmad Didat got up and he slapped this man through his face. He, he, he slapped him and this guy's face was red and it stung with this, you know, as a result of the slap. And then Ahmad Didat said, what does your Bible say? When you are slapped on the one cheek, what must you do? He said, come on, turn the other cheek. And this man did it. He turned the other cheek and this guy slapped him again so hard. And when he had regained his composure, this man went on to deliver his lesson and there wasn't a sound. You could hear a pin a pin drop in that auditorium. Apparently later that day when this professor went to his office after the lectures were over, the students, Muslim students, were lining up outside his door wanting to speak with this man. Thought, wow. True story. True story. Powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. So, as we continue to look at this, I wanted to look at some uh, examples, you know, when we, we know about these, uh, Joseph was mentioned, yes, Brother Ledge?
Yes. Correct. Very good point. Very good point. Brother Ledger is saying if for the Jews there was no greater insult to be slapped through the face. And uh, but he says Jesus goes beyond, beyond the physical saying that even if someone insults you, you should not insult that person in return. Uh, by the way, you know, it was a, it was a very, very good... Uh, you, uh, do you remember Winston Churchill's uh, responses that... Um, uh, that he would make to people. He had very sarcastic responses. Uh, and, <laughs> and I remember one of, there was a woman at one occasion at some dinner party, um, and this woman came up to Winston Churchill and said to him, Sir, you are drunk. And Winston Churchill replied, I might be drunk now, but tomorrow morning I'll be sober. However, you are ugly, and there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> Don't do <laughs> <laughs> Don't do things like that. I'm just saying Winston Churchill had, he obviously never read this section in the Bible, <laughs> Brother Ledge. So think about Joseph in forgiving his brothers. You know, the story of Joseph, the account of Joseph is such an endearing one and uh, very illustrative of what we're talking about tonight. And I think especially when you have the power to retaliate, you know, someone has hurt you. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. And he had a hard life for about 13 years or so. Eventually comes to power. And there's a family in the land. The family is forced to come from uh, Judea to come and buy food from Joseph. And they didn't even recognize him. And Joseph had the power to, as second in command in Egypt, he could have put them to death. That's the power he had. He had the power of life or death as the prime minister of Egypt. And so remember, he, he eventually uh, brings the whole family up to Egypt uh, to, to come and stay with him in Goshen. And then when their father Jacob dies, now they're really afraid. Because they, they probably thought while their father is alive, Joseph will restrain his anger. But now the father is dead. And there's no good reason why Joseph should not uh, retaliate or, or deal with them. And in Genesis chapter 50, when he, when he realizes that they are cowering and shaking in their boots and they are so afraid, he calls them and he says to them, am I in the place of God? And he says, you meant evil against me. He says, but God meant it for good. And he says, God sent me ahead of you so that I could save the lives of many and I think a man like Joseph was a guy that he got it. He really understood that what had happened to him was, I think, Romans 8.28. Hey? All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose, Brother Ledge. There's another, another reason why God sent Jesus' mind. Hmm. You can tell a Christian who God has Right. might be muddying the, the very waters. You're absolutely right. Yeah, God has his plan with everyone. And I think it's just also part of it is, you know, when you look at it on a psychological level, you look at bullies, like for example, bully, playground bullies, they tend to be insecure and have problems at home, you know, and might not receive love at home. So what do they, what do, they do? They come to the schoolyard and they take their frustration out uh, on, uh, and they, you know, low self-esteem they take out on, on, on other children that cannot defend themselves. And so one, when one is secure, remember Jesus knew who he was. John chapter 13, uh, with the washing of the feet, uh, very clearly says that Jesus, knowing who he was, he went into the upper room and they sat down and had the Lord's Supper. And so Jesus, knew, nothing changed who Jesus was by washing the feet of his disciples. Nothing changed. He could have ordered them to do it. But instead, 
he washed their feet and showed them how to serve. Um, what about David in sparing the life of Saul? And remember, at least, I think there were two occasions when uh, David could have killed Saul. One was when he was lying in the camp sleeping. And remember how he went into the camp and he took Saul's water jug. And when he left, he called out to the, to the king uh, and you know, told him that, I've got your water jug. If I wanted, I could have killed you. And the king said to David, you're more righteous than I am. You know, and the king packed up and went home. But there was another time when uh, Saul was pursuing uh, David and David and his men were in the dark zone of the cave. They were right at the back in the cave. And you know what it is like. If you come into a dark cave from the bright sunlight, you can't see anything. And Saul went in and he relieved himself, the scripture says. And David's men in the back of the cave said to him, hey, now's your chance. And remember they said to David, maybe this is the Lord giving Saul into your hands. And what did David say? Far be it for me to lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. David realized that Saul was the anointed king and that only God could remove Saul. And so David would not touch Saul and he spared his life. And you know, when you think about that, I have tremendous respect for a man like David for doing that. Because I don't know what I would have done had that been me in that cave. And this man is at my, you know, he's, he's, I've got him dead to rights, as they, would, as they would say in the cowboy movies. Let's take a look quickly, uh, 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23. At Elisha, I came across a scripture today where Elisha is, is called a madman. <laughs> Elisha is called a madman. Second Kings six eight through twenty three. Hmm, I was right there. Second Kings chapter six eight through twenty three. Second Kings chapter six eight through twenty three. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, "My camp will be in such and such a place." And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass the place, for the Syrians are coming down there. So here Elisha is warning the king of Israel about the plans of the Syrians. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Verse 11. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly, greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of you, which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Verse 14, Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and he went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Verse 16, so he answered them, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. So it was, when they had come to Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and they were inside Samaria. Now when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? But he answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Verse 23. Then he prepared a great feast for them, and they ate and they drank, and he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. Is that maybe what the Lord was referring to? To rather feed your enemy? If, if he's hungry, give him to eat, like Elisha did. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And look at the result of this, that... These Syrians who were sent by their king to get Elisha, and obviously there's only one thing that they wanted to do with him, was they wanted to get rid of him. And Elisha knew that. And what did he do? He led them 
along a merry path, brought them to the city of Samaria where the king was. The king was excited to, to see these men being led right up to his front door. And he says, hey, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? And Elisha says, no. Put food and, and drink in, uh, before them and feed them and uh, send them back to their master. And that stopped the raiding parties at that time into Israel. So very often when you do the opposite to people that are intent on hurting you, you bring about a change in their attitude. And as I said earlier, sometimes it's not easy. And Brother Ledge quoted for us uh, or read for us uh, about Jesus being our example of this. Again, when we look at the marks of authenticity of Jesus, you know, why is Jesus authentic? Because he practices what he preaches. He doesn't just tell his disciples and us what to do and sit in his ivory tower. No, he does exactly that which uh, he expects us to do. 1 Peter 2, 20 and 23. 1 Peter chapter 2, 20 through 23. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, Aina is what I say to this text. For to this you were called. But Lord, what about those preaching health, wealth, and prosperity? No, that's not what we were called to. He says, for this you were called because Christ also suffered for us. Another version says, suffered for you. Leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. Let's put it into modern uh, language. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. How often I want to emulate Winston Churchill, you know, with a couple of quick insults in reply. And very often to people don't respond in like manner they respond even worse. I've seen, a, I saw a car chase one time. I don't know what it entailed. If a guy had cut off another guy, if he had not used an indicator, but a car chase ensued. And because I was uh, a few hundred meters behind, I saw how this whole thing played out. They nearly crashed into each other. You know, over a simple, maybe the guy didn't, Maybe he wasn't thinking. Maybe he wasn't sure where he was going. Forgot to put on his indicator. We all occasionally forget to do that. I forgot today to put on my indicator. Fortunately, no one saw. <laughs> but look at verse 23 again. When he was insulted, did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And of course, we know that our Lord and Savior was vindicated. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. And he rose to take up his place when he ascended into heaven as king of kings and lord of lords. And so we need to wait upon the Lord. I wanted to tell you just very briefly that there was, this is a true story, there was a, a, a young lady, she was a servant girl, uh, and she died in, during the reign of the emperor Marcus Aurelius she was put to death in 177 AD. Her name was Blandina, and she lived in a, a, the, the town today is called Lyon in the south of France, Blandina or Blandine. If you go there today, there is a, uh, there's a church building where there's a stained glass. All right, we are done. That's, that's my cue. There's a stained glass window uh, that is dedicated to this young lady who died in 177 AD. And uh, she was tortured for her faith. And they wanted her to recant, to, you know, to recant her faith, to, to, to renounce her faith in Christ and the Lord Jesus. And as they were persecuting her and torturing her, and because she was a slave, uh, slaves could be tortured, not citizens. Citizens, if they were found guilty of a capital offense, they could be put to death, executed by the sword, but slaves could be tortured. And she was tortured for days, 
and she held on to her faith and she repeatedly said, we are Christians and we do no harm. We are Christians and we do no harm. And eventually uh, she, was, uh, she was killed, she was stabbed to death after she was tortured for days. True story, Blandina. Um, and you know, when you think about that, about being tortured for your faith, young slave girl, her master was a slave, uh, uh, her master rather was a Christian as well, and he was also arrested. And because of her example, it led to many others uh, also clinging and holding on to their faith in Christ because of the way she lived her life and the way she died. Uh, in fact, there's an amphithe amphitheater, uh, the ruins are an amphitheater in that town, and uh, there's a, 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 an ancient pole that has been erected there in honor of the martyrs who died in that uh, arena, uh, who would not do any harm or any wrong, even when they were persecuted, tortured, and put to death for their faith. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you, dear Lord, for our study tonight. And Father, help us to be like our Savior. Help us, Father, to be like Jesus. Help us, Father, that we would not just study a passage like this, but make it our aim and our goal, Father, to not repay insult for insult, or not to, Father, uh, want to inflict harm uh, upon those that have harmed us. We pray, Father, that you give us uh, the perseverance and the patience of Job, and pray, Father, that we will be long-suffering with one another, with our family members, and with the world out there, mighty God. Thank you, Father, again for Jesus and Father, for not just telling us what to do, but also for showing us and setting that example, mighty God, for us to follow in his steps. Father, we again think tonight of those that are sick and suffering, those that are in hospitals, Father. We think of Mrs. Harris, and we think of uh, Kareen, Father, and others who are not well. We pray, Father, that you would lay your hand of healing upon them, Father, and if, if it be your will, to restore them, Father, to a measure of health that they desire. Go with us, Father, as we go to our homes tonight. Keep us safe on the roads and give us a good night's rest. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.